Hey ho, tutor minded people. I'm Gage. I'm Jessica. We're Tutor Time Machine, and this is episode 57 of our podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If this is your first time here, there's plenty of episodes to listen to. <laughs> 56. Yes, it is best to start at episode one. This is a story project. It goes in order and we don't want you to miss any of the twists and turns of our tale. We're so fortunate. We have listeners all over the world now. It's incredible. It is very exciting for us to be sharing this podcast with everyone. So if you're enjoying it, support us. Buy some Tudor Time Machine swag. Yes, go to the Tudor Time Machine Facebook page, hit the shop now button, and bye, bye, bye. You can get a Do You Tutor tee or a Tutor Time Machine logo sweatshirt. And you'll be supporting the podcast at the same time. And we really appreciate it. I love mine. I wear it all the time. I do too. In our last episode, we saw Constance escaping her fate with Charles Paget to sail away with the Vasa. But now we're going to 1536 to find Margaret Wyatt doing a last service for her good friend Anne Boleyn. And after the reading, we'll have some fun as we always do, discussing the history beyond our tale and making some connections between then and now. Read on, Jesse. Chapter 57, 1536, The Tower of London, in which Margaret's skirt carries the story. Again, Anne began her strange laughter, as if she remembered something vaguely embarrassing. Shaking her head, she would chuckle to herself, then spur herself on, rocking with convulsions. Reverberating in Margaret's head until she thought it would explode, the sound was impossibly grating. But the poor woman was about to die. Margaret could hardly tell Anne to collect herself. Putting her arms around Anne's shoulders, Margaret said under her breath, Anne, stop, I beg you, stop laughing. These spies shall think you mad. The devil seizes her. Lady Isabel Stoner opined, with tired repetition. If you let her confess, God might have mercy. This set Anne off in another convulsion of giggles. She has confessed to the Archbishop of Canterbury, Margaret reminded. You sat there, Lady Isabel, as she did so. Is your memory so short? What drove Isabel Stoner? wondered Margaret. Did the woman worry for the state of Anne's soul? Or did she just want to humiliate, hoping fear would drive the desperate prisoner to a Catholic priest in her final hour? The Stoners would crow over that. Lady Isabel said, I recall Cranmer's visit, but as to his service as an intermediary, I cannot vouch. I urge a more pious voice between the Lady Anne Boleyn and the Almighty. You, Lady Margaret, who call yourself her long-time friend, you care nothing for her eternal soul. Jesu, Isabel Stoner brought up the bile, thought Margaret. She could taste it. Lady Isabel, Anne shall die in the faith she has lived in. How many times must we tread this road? Lady Isabel, call for more wine. The jug is empty. Mary Scrope's pushed-in face looked forlorn. Madge Shelton's nasal twang trumpeted through. To our king, Lady Anne must confess. Oh, Margaret, I am her cuz. I do not wish her death. Margaret was almost entirely sure that was a lie. Oh, Margaret, Madge insisted, give the Lady Anne a chance to breathe the fresh air. Let her confess to the king the names of her other lovers. The secrets drive her to madness. Did the king himself not see the line of men to her bed? Margaret spat. The throng crowded the halls of the castle and crossed London Bridge. You make light. I do not. Are five heads not enough for you, Madge? You are a Dianides. If Sir Henry Norris had lived till your wedding night, you would have killed him yourself. That is not true. You think yourself so loyal, but I would not stand against the wisdom of our king as you do. You are a foolish thing. You have not the sense to keep your head, but you will have the company of your half-wit brother, Thomas Wyatt. Anne shrieked with laughter. It shut the ladies' mouths. Maybe that was why she did it. Margaret hated each of these women in a particular way. Isabel Stoner for her sanctimonious lip-pursing and weepily aggressive zeal. Mary Scrope for her sleeping and yawning and kicking her feet out as if she were an unoccupied child, and Madge Shelton with the soul of a rat and words of false solicitousness. Of the three, Madge Shelton was the most horrible. Anne, Anne, please be calm, 
Margaret soothed. Anne quieted and kissed Margaret's cheek, muttering, Can they not see the absurdity of a marriage lived faithfully, to be beheaded for unfaithfulness? Anne had swooped through every possibility, cast blame and held out hope in an exhaustive rhythm. Through the days of imprisonment, Margaret held on as Anne's mind careened. The king was a mewling infant, Margaret thought. He would slaughter Anne because he lacked the seed to produce a son. If only Anne had had a boy, one that lived. If only the king would put her away as he had Catherine. But he could not face the fight of another annulment. He could not stand up to Catherine of Aragon, much less an Anne Boleyn. I am tired, Margaret, Anne whispered. Margaret commanded. Lady Anne would have a moment of rest. I would go with you, Isabel Stoner said with false, or perhaps genuine, concern. Can we not pray together? These three terrible days Margaret had not been alone with Anne. It was too cruel. For pity's sake, might we have one moment? Lady Anne needs solace. You are almost a stranger. I have known her since we were children. Lady Isabel turned to the napping scrope, and then to Mad Shelton, who made a face at the idea of sitting in the bedchamber with Anne and Margaret. Groaning on the inside, Margaret smiled warmly as Isabel officiously walked into the adjoining chamber, took quick stock of whatever might be within, and gave Margaret a nod. You may take her in to rest. Holding Anne's hand tightly, Margaret helped her up, drew her close with her arm around her waist, whispered to her that she could lie down in but a few steps. When they closed the door to the chamber, Anne sprang out of her arms, hissing, I must write to Thomas! Anne crouched by the bed and withdrew a quill stored under the mattress. She must want to make one last bit of trouble. Margaret snatched it from Anne's hand. It is not right, Anne. It is not right. It is right. Should I let Thomas die believing I did not love him? Should I let him die not knowing? Return the quill. Margaret, indeed, return it now. Margaret struggled within herself. Her brother was to be released from the tower. He had been caught up in the chaos of Anne's arrest but he was not one of the five men condemned to death. He was to go free. Cromwell had promised it would be so. Should she tell Anne? Would it be more or less painful for Anne to think that she was condemned when Thomas might live? Anne pulled the quill from Margaret's fingers. Fie, Anne! Must you always have your way? Shall I not have it now I am to die? You are a mule. You agree with your brother in that. What shall I write on? The bedclothes? No, take off your dress. I shall write on your back. Indeed not. You will not write it on my skin. Here, write it on my underskirt. He may read it there. Margaret wondered if Mad Shelton was right, that she herself would meet the block. Margaret sat on the floor, and Anne began to write quickly, without hesitation, as if she had composed and revised her words in her mind, and only waited for the moment to set the sentences down. Does Lady Anne sleep? came a voice from the ante-room. Not yet, Margaret called as Anne laid down the pen. I shall return. Rest if you can. What if they take me while you are gone? Anne's face was placid, but to ask, to make such a comment? Margaret knew her friend was choking with fear. I will be with you at the last, Cromwell assured me. That man deserves death, Anne stated, again with little emotion. Margaret leaned over and kissed Anne's head and hair. Isabel Stoner frowned at Margaret as she emerged from the chamber. Do you not wish to stay with her? I must see my brother. Why so? Because, Lady Isabel, my brother has been arrested. He is being held here in the tower, and it is possible that his head will soon be severed from his body and his limbs pulled from his trunk. I wish to say goodbye before he is in such a state. Even Lady Isabel found no answer to such words. Margaret continued. Lady Anne rests. This is the time for my visit to him. The three fates stood as a barrier between herself and the way out. Yet she was no prisoner. They could not stop her. She picked up her skirts and walked straight into them. My pardon, ladies. Perhaps you did not notice that you are between me and the door. She nudged Mad Shelton as she pushed past to knock for the guard to let her out. The ladies were staring at her back. She could feel it. As the door opened, Margaret scuttled through. She heard the ladies rustling behind her as the door swung shut, and then as soon as she had gone a few feet, there was a frantic rapping. The spies were rapping on Anne's door. 
Margaret walked as quickly as she could, just below a run, skimming down the stairs. She surged out of the doorway to cross the green. Lady Isabel Stoner's voice cut the air. That woman has a note, a note from the prisoner, from Lady Anne. You must stop her. Here, here, the quill. Isabel held it out the window. Margaret halted. She turned to the two men approaching her. They were huge, well-liveried specimens. Margaret drew herself up, and they bowed and made themselves humble to her. I have nothing, Margaret said. Lady Isabel calls me out because she is peevish, because she knows I am rushed. Lady Anne is permitted a quill. Lady Isabel makes a fuss for nothing. Her purse, cried Lady Isabel from above. Look there! Margaret dutifully pulled her bag off her girdle and opened it, making a little grimace to show how ridiculous this whole situation was. The larger guard shouted up to Isabel Stoner. My lady, the purse is empty. I am on my way then, sir. Margaret said. I have let you see my bag to show you my respect, but there is no call. She looked up at her agitator, who still held out the quill. Yet what could the woman do? She could not fly out of the window, wrestle her and rip through her skirts. Margaret felt the blush of satisfaction that she had scored a hit. I shall return soon, Lady Isabel, she called, knowing a tenacious ferret like Isabel Stoner would never be appeased by this cursory search but Thomas would rip the words from her skirt and then burn the bit of fabric, and the whole truth would be gone forever. The stoner might suspect something, but she could never imagine what the words on Margaret's skirt revealed. Even from the distance of 500 years, Anne Boleyn's death is still shocking. And at the time, I, I think up until the final moment of Anne's life, everyone around her, or many of the people around her, must have imagined she was going to be pardoned by Henry. I think so. Because a king ordering the execution of his crowned queen was, as far as I know, completely unprecedented in England. And I read that Anne initially said that she had been given the option to go to a convent. Didn't Henry at first offer that option to Catherine of Aragon? I think so. Oh, but Catherine absolutely refused it. She maintained that Henry was her lawful husband. She was not going to that convent. I think if that had really been a choice, Anne would have taken the veil. Rather than lose her head, for sure, she would have. It's peculiar to imagine Anne Boleyn as a nun because she's been considered sort of a Protestant saint. She was even one of those included in the Puritan preacher John Fox's Book of Martyrs, which was sort of the book of Protestant basically Protestant saints, although of course they weren't called saints. That view that she was a Protestant saint became popularized during Elizabeth's reign because Anne's reputation needed to be reconstructed and revisited. And Fox wrote that about her in the 1560s. He wanted to please Elizabeth I totally agree with that. If Elizabeth was a legitimate queen, her mother had to have been a virtuous woman. That was just the way it was at the times. And the sort of superficial or kind of capsulated history of Anne Boleyn is that she was the catalyst for Henry's break with Rome. And she was, but it's so much more complicated than that because she wanted reform. Of course, she was a religious reformer, but it's hard to know how far she really would have wanted that religious reform to go. Just because she wanted religious reform doesn't necessarily mean she would have been what we would consider or what came to be considered a Protestant in Edward VI's reign. Things were changing and shifting. And I think lots of times we sort of look at a moment that precedes another moment as if everything was already sort of set up and in place. And the dissolution of the monasteries and the convents in England really didn't get going until after Anne was already dead. So when she said, I'll go be a nun, those convents still existed. They were under threat, but they did exist. Anne possibly would have still considered herself a Catholic when she died in 1536. Again, a religious reformer Catholic, but a Catholic nonetheless. I think so. And her personal priest was Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury. And even though he also, of course, became known as a great Protestant martyr, in 1536, he was not a Protestant. No, not yet. He was a reformer, but he didn't become a Protestant until Edward's reign. Religious change in Henry's reign took a lot longer than it sounds like it does, summed up in a history book. So it will say, oh, Henry, he broke with the Pope and founded the Church of England, as if it was quick and easy. <laughs> 
as we've said before in this podcast, Henry considered himself a Catholic when he died. He just was a Catholic who didn't believe that the Pope had authority over him, but he wanted masses said for his soul in perpetuity. He wanted a chancery. He wanted all these big Catholic traditions. But he did not get that. No, because his son was a Protestant. And in the end, no one gave Anne the choice of being a nun. I just don't think Henry would have settled for that. He was just too furious, put her away somewhere like he did with Catherine. And he did not want her alive, proclaiming herself the rightful queen as Catherine had done. He wanted Anne dead. Yes, and he probably disliked people thinking that he was a cuckold, or even more personally, that Anne didn't want him. Mm -hmm. I think the whole thing was very shameful for him. I think Henry really thought she had been unfaithful and that she deserved death, but I, I don't think Thomas Cromwell believed she had been unfaithful. I don't think so either. Henry was vain and impulsive and personally disgraced, and he he was hurt and he wanted to get rid of her and he was willing to believe the worst of her but Cromwell was less blinded by emotion and I'm sure he knew she wasn't guilty. And Cromwell was the one who collected the quote unquote evidence against Anne. He must have known most of it was bordering on the absurd and, and gotten by torture, which was never reliable. So who do you think was the driver of Anne's downfall? Was it Henry driving Cromwell or was it Cromwell driving Henry for his own ends? Well, you know, I always assume the worst of Henry. So I think it was Henry driving Cromwell. Henry apologists see Cromwell as the mastermind behind the whole thing. Sure. In the same way that Cardinal Wolsey was blamed for the annulment with Catherine of Aragon. But as we know now, Wolsey was against that in the beginning. He just went along with the king's will. There is historical speculation that there was bad blood between Anne and Cromwell and that he wanted her gone. And certainly the historian Eric Ives believes that. Cromwell manipulating Henry into executing his wife, the crowned queen of England? I think that would have been impossible if Henry hadn't desired it. Impossible even for Cromwell. He could have undermined Anne's influence with Henry, or he could have put another woman forward to be Henry's mistress, to gain power over the king. I think that sort of thing happened all the time at European courts. But to plot to get the queen executed? I think that had to come from Henry. I have to agree with that. Henry holds the bag at the end of the day. And that's certainly Hilary Mantel's point of view. And we love her. And there are different theories and points of yeah. view about these big historical questions. And the villains change as modern historians change and see things in different ways. No, I think that's right. Historical figures get rehabilitated or their demonization is solidified or even goes further according to the ideas of the, the generation that's examining them and the sensibilities. And in fact, the more I know about the Tudor period, the less sure I am that I know how to read it, how to understand it. You find that you've read certain things that people say with complete conviction. And then you see that historians are re-examining those statements and finding that there was much less historical evidence for whatever that statement was, that maybe somebody saw something in one letter from someone who wasn't even there, and then that was just taken verbatim. So even contemporary accounts are sometimes tricky because you have to consider who wrote it, what was their actual connection to what, what happened, was it something they heard, was it something they actually saw? It's very complicated. It is the onion, right? You never actually get the truth of it. Because history really is an argument. We joke that every historian who researches ladies in waiting, they're all arguing for their girl being Elizabeth's favorite. New sources come to light, old sources that people assumed were verifiable or scrutinized, and they turn out to be not as certain as everyone thought. So it's constantly in flux. In this reading, we're in May 1536. And in January 1536, Catherine Aragon died. That's probably. not debatable. <laughs> it's when they opened her up, her heart was black. So people at the time thought she had been poisoned, which was why all those rumors started that Anne had poisoned her. But doctors now think it was probably cancer of the heart. And, and here we go with another thing you might have read, that Anne and Henry famously dressed all in yellow to mark Catherine's death. Was wearing yellow a big insult to the dead Catherine? Was it a nasty way of indicating that her death was being celebrated? Or, as we've also read, was it a respectful nod to the tradition of wearing yellow for mourning in Catherine's native Spain? I have read that. It probably was neither of those. And the thing about it being used for mourning in Spain is apparently not true at all. 
Right, because the colors for mourning in Spain were black and white. Anne Boleyn historian Claire Ridgway, who we also love, suggests the color yellow was neither an insult nor a commemoration of Catherine, but simply to signify a new beginning for Anne and Henry, especially because Anne was pregnant again. Why would they do it? They're showing themselves to be wonderful and strong. Do they really want to show to the people of London that they're petty and making fun of a queen that, frankly, those people love. I did read also that this idea of them all dressing in yellow and it being so disrespectful was in one letter that the Spanish diplomat sent to Philip of Spain. No one else says they dressed in yellow, but history has taken that as a definitive statement that they dressed from head to toe in yellow. One thing we can probably hazard is that in January, Anne must have been feeling pretty confident because Catherine is finally gone. And she's pregnant again. She has this hope of a son, but... She lost the baby, which is very sad. And the king's new mistress, Jane Seymour, was moved into royal quarters. And Anne's brother, George Boleyn, was passed up for the order of the royal garter. So that's not good. Anne might have felt her position at court was unstable, but I don't think she ever imagined that she would be executed. No, and executed within, what, like two or three months? from when she lost that baby. How could she have anticipated that? Because a king moving his new mistress into royal apartments and overlooking his wife's relative for influential position, that was sort of normal court BS. But I read that Henry started talking about having been forced into his marriage with Anne by sotelage or something, which was a French word, which means by deception or with a spell. And if that's accurate, that he did talk about that, it may have made her nervous that he was thinking that way. Yeah, I think that probably would have made her very nervous because accusations of witchcraft and spells, and that's very dangerous territory for women in this period. And Henry, of course, loved to blame outside forces for his decisions it's a piece, right? So getting rid of Catherine was God's will and falling in love with Anne was devilish witchcraft. Nothing was his fault. There was a law on the English books, which was passed by Edward III in the 14th century that specifically made adultery by a queen treason because of the implications for succession. So that idea that it was treason was actually a law, but in, you know, Edward III famously had his mother, Isabella's lover, Roger Mortimer, hung at Tyburn. But first of all, Henry really dug up this law. I mean, yeah, it's a 200 or 300 year old law. And he did not have Queen Isabella hung. She was imprisoned in relative comfort for two years. And then she retired from court and lived pretty well for years after that. So that was a kind of a more standard thing. Yeah, so actually carrying out a death sentence against an adulterous queen, it had no precedent in England in 1536. It was something that people had never seen or experienced. Henry could have been merciful. He could have imprisoned Anne, declared Elizabeth illegitimate, which of course he did, and then he could have left it at that. He didn't need to have her executed. Anne and her motives are a source of constant historical speculation. But I did read somewhere that someone said, well, Anne didn't agree to be a nun because she didn't want Elizabeth to be declared illegitimate. The one thing that Anne could have seen very clearly from this whole situation was that Elizabeth was going to be declared illegitimate, that there was no question about that. I think Anne was motivated by love of her child and not wanting harm to come to her. But I don't think at this point she could have had any illusion that Elizabeth wasn't going to be taken out of the line of succession. Henry showed his mercy by getting a swordsman from France to cut Anne's head off instead of submitting her to an axe. The irony that as he was moving his mistress closer to his royal bed, he was having his wife arrested for adultery. The double standard. The first arrest was Mark Smeaton in April, then Sir Henry Norris, then Sir Francis Weston, then Sir William Brereton, and finally George Boleyn. And of course, at this point, Anne must have been getting incredibly anxious. And Richard Page and Sir Thomas Wyatt, our own Sir Thomas Wyatt, were also arrested at this time. 
So there are, again, there are differing accounts of why exactly why it was arrested. Often historians put him in this group of men who were arrested for adultery with Anne. But we've also read that he was arrested for a much lesser charge that just happened to occur at the same time as all of this was going on. It makes more sense. Why would he have been the only one to be cleared of committing adultery out of all those powerful men? Yes, he was friends with Cromwell, but still. Richard Page, who you and I really don't know that much about, maybe there's a Richard Page expert out there. We'd love to talk to you. But he was also exonerated. Well, maybe Wyatt and Page were there to show kind of a supposed mercy by the king. You mean by arresting seven men and only executing five, only finding five guilty, it makes it seem more as if those five actually were guilty. Yes. Finding some innocent and some guilty makes it seem as if the accusations were actually tested by a law. That's that's really true. Anne herself was arrested on May 2nd at Greenwich Palace and taken to the tower by barge. Not through the streets like a common criminal. Again, this was like a kindness and she was not publicly shamed. No, she was still queen at this point and even a queen arrested for treason had certain privileges. At the tower, she probably used the royal entrance at the Byward Tower, which was then called the Court Gate, and that would have been her right to use as she was still queen. She was received by Sir William Kingston, the keeper of the tower. So there were protocols. And I've read that she was taken through Traitor's Gate, but actually that's really unlikely given her position. And anyway, that ominous dank gate was not even called by that name until 1544. And the lodging she was put in were the queen's apartments in the tower's royal palace. And they were ones that she had stayed in during her coronation celebrations, which were only three years before this. She stayed in very lavish apartments and she had a beautiful gallery to walk in and an enclosed garden to enjoy. So Henry had spent the equivalent of almost $2 million to renovate the rooms for Anne. Before her coronation, the Tower Palace was in disrepair and he fixed it up for Anne and gave her this beautiful place to wait for her coronation. All that money made for very well appointed chambers for her in 1536 when she was awaiting her trial and awaiting her fate. Oh, it's so twisted. Yeah. Terrible. Because when she was a prisoner, she was sleeping in the Queen's great apartments with windows overlooking her garden. I wonder if that luxury gave Anne a distorted picture of how much trouble she was in and what her fate would be. Maybe it must have been surreal being a prisoner, but being feted and dined with the keeper of the tower, Kingston, every night in the great hall. She was well treated with whatever food she liked, whatever wine she wanted. And she was there for two weeks. And Kingston reported that she was initially hopeful for her life. There are some differing accounts of who served Anne in the tower, but it's pretty certain that one of them, who was probably placed there by Henry to spy on Anne, was Mrs. Stoner, wife of Walter Stoner, who would have been a relative of our own dear Constance. Indeed, and Mary Scrope, Lady Kingston, wife of the Keeper of the Tower. And a Mistress Shelton. And again, there's confusion about who exactly that Mistress Shelton was, because as we've pointed out many times... Everyone has the same name. <laughs> yes, so we chose Mad Shelton, Anne's cousin. So we don't know exactly who went to the scaffold with Anne, but there is a tradition that she gave Margaret Wyatt her prayer book. And we love that idea, even if it's just a legend. What a horrific scene it must have been for Anne's attendants to watch her die and then to have to clean her body and arrange it for burial. This is something we read, but what it must have actually been like to pick up this bloody corpse off a scaffold and find her head and put them together and clean her clothes off. Just, it's sort of mind boggling. Just crushing and it's, a, it's just terrible. And then 11 days later, England had a new queen, Jane Seymour. And Thomas Cranmer, who had heard Anne's last confession and was the only person at court to mourn for her, had to officiate at Henry's new marriage. What, I just wonder what he thought. He must've just thought this guy is insane. 
Yeah, and I think a lot of people in Europe who heard about this whole thing that was going down in England must have thought it was insane too. I mean, I don't think it was sort of something where every other king went, oh, yes, this is what kings do. What was going on in England at this time was very shocking for most people in Europe too. And Henry must have been completely certain that every horrible order he gave was irreproachable because otherwise I don't think he could have married in 11 days. Well, he was a sociopath, that's how. We began with you hating on Henry. So let's end there too. Yes, why break with tradition? But next time we'll see Philomena as she gets the news of Constance escape to Sweden, not going off to Spain with Charles Paget. So join us next time for more Times Riddle and more Tudor-minded talk. Thank you.